Note that it says here, they should be fought totally until they return to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And Islam tells us, at least within the Sharia, these conditions are to be applied to them in their homeland. So this is not in the land of the Muslims, but in the land of the infidel. It does say, of course, that if the lands of Muslims are invaded, they have a right to defend themselves. And that, I think, is a normal human right. There's nothing unusual about that. However, we do need to separate from their invasion of non-Muslim lands to impose Islam versus them defending themselves, which is a human right. Muslims are very quick to tell us, no, but these rules only apply to when the Muslim lands are invaded and forget to tell us, or they don't even know. They may be ignorant or they may be lying, but they don't discuss what the rules are from the Sharia when Muslims are to invade the lands of others to impose Islam. Ibn Taymiyyah began to show the merits of the Mujahideen and the virtues of Jihad in the cause of Allah. He explained that Jihad will be ongoing till the day of judgment and he used the following authentic hadith as a proof. There will always remain a group of people from my nation fighting upon the truth, the truth being Islam, the religion of truth, and subjugating their enemies. Now we know that a group of people that quote unquote small minority will always be fighting to impose Islam or their idea of the truth, subjugating the enemies, which is the non-Muslims. So now we have Hadith and Quranic verses showing the importance of Jihad and the inevitable victory of the Muslims. They even speak of a group called the Victorious Group that are the Mujahideen warriors. He proved that there is nothing higher in status than Jihad and no rank can rise above the level of Mujahideen and martyrs in the path of Allah. Jihad is a holy sacrament in Islam. It is the highest of religious honors. He took the responsibility for training the armies and to organize Mujahideen groups. He was responsible for raids against the Tatar military camps. He also attacked the region where the Bataniya people in the mountains of Sham resided. Now, notice it says here, the Bataniya were a heretical sect who kept hidden the true nature of their beliefs. Siding with the enemies of Islam, they sought to propagate their creed based on Magian doctrines and Platonic concepts. If you read through the um, Reliance of the Travel, you'll discover that Ghazali wiped out the Metazolites because they wanted to follow rational Greek Aristotelian concepts. Islam is a completely contrary view of what the truth is, and it's not based on our standard Western Aristotelian and Platonic concepts. Notice here, it was later proven to him that they used takia or calculated deception. Tamir did not hesitate to fight and hound the Tatars, and he passed fatwa exposing their hidden beliefs and called for the necessity to fight them. A fatwa is a religious decree. Ibn Tamir also partnered with Sultan al Nasr in his war against Kazan, who claimed to be Muslim and named himself Mahmud. It was proven to Ibn Tamir otherwise because the Kazan refused to completely uphold Islamic Sharia. He disrespected Allah's laws. He governed the Islamic country by the book of Al Yasik which was a mixture of laws from Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and the laws of Genghis Khan. He discarded the laws that were sent down to the Muslims in the Quran and the Sunnah. Now you see the genesis of the idea that Muslims must fight other Muslims who are not Muslim enough. If you do not comply with the strict view of what Islam is in the Sharia, you are to be fought. They speak here of defending Islam. Defending Islam doesn't necessarily mean, and in this case it doesn't mean Defending from invasion, defending Islam means to defend it from corruption, from being altered, from not being practiced as defined in the Sharia. So here you've got someone who wasn't fighting with the Muslims, but was merely adding doctrines to it, which differed from the Sharia, and they had to be fought. Make a note of that. Often you're not being given the full picture and you're given a misleading idea of what defense and attack and so on is. Ibn Tamir wrote a book called Jihad al-Kufar al-Qital al-Fasil, which is translated as Jihad against the disbelievers, the decisive fight. People always say Jihad, you know, Qital means fighting, Jihad means struggle. No, Jihad means fighting you. And here we've got the two words together. So Jihad is a decisive fight against the disbelievers. The full name of the book again is Governance According to the Sharia in Reforming the Ruler and His Flock. We're told you that Muslims have to obey Muslim rulers in authority when they govern by the Sharia and they protect Muslim lands. If they do not obey the Sharia as rulers, then they are to be removed. The Sharia introduces penalties for those who disobey Allah. They speak here of penalties for those who are under the sway of the Imam. Those under the sway of the Imam are Muslims. Now they speak of a second group 
who are recalcitrant groups, in other words, groups who are hesitant to embrace Islam. That means you, a non-Muslim. The punishment of recalcitrant groups, such as those that can only be brought under the sway of the Imam by a decisive fight. That's the jihad against non-Muslims to make them Muslim. That then is the jihad against the unbelievers, the kafir, the enemies of Allah and his messenger. So if you're a kafir, if you're a non-believer, you are automatically an enemy of Allah and an enemy of Muhammad. Whoever has heard the summons of the Messenger of Allah and has not responded to it must be fought. Now, if you know about Islam, if you're in America or Britain or France or some Western country and you've heard the message of Islam and you've not responded to it, you are an enemy of Allah. You're an enemy of Muhammad and you must be fought. And as the Quran said, and has not responded to it, they must be fought until there is no more fitna and the religion is entirely for Allah. We can see here that this is Quran 8.39, fight them until there is no fitna and until the religion, all of it, is for Allah. So all worship on earth must be for Allah. When Allah sent his prophet and ordered him to summon the people to his religion, he did not permit him to kill or fight anyone for that reason before the prophet emigrated to Medina. Thereafter, he gave him and the Muslims permission to fight with the words. Permission is given to those who are fought. Now, this relates to Muslims always saying, well, you know, we're not allowed to fight. We only fight to defend ourselves. That's true. There were multiple pledges, and this was the early stage when the Muslims were not powerful enough to go on the offense. Then after that, he imposed fighting on them with the following words. Fighting is prescribed for you, though it will be hateful to you. It may happen that you will hate a thing which is better for you, and it may happen that you love a thing which is worse for you. Allah knows, and you know not. He has emphasized this command and glorified jihad in many of the Medinan chapters. The Quran is divided into the early and the late phase, the Meccan phase, the Medinan phase. The Medinan phase is when Muhammad made the Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. He became a political leader. The Hijrah is a form of jihad. And for this jihad, you receive the full rewards of paradise. If you die on the way to do immigration, to spread Islam by immigration, you will earn paradise. Muhammad is a failure as as a religious leader. After 13 years, he only about 150 followers. He then became a political leader, then became a military leader. That's when he had the power and the money to raise an army and go to war. And that's how he proselytized through the sword. Allah has criticized those who fail to participate in jihad and he has called them hypocrites and sick in their hearts. Allah has said, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your wives and your clan and your wealth that you've gained and the commerce you fear may decline, and the dwellings that you love are dearer to you than Allah and his messenger and jihad in the way of Allah. Wait till Allah brings his punishment. Allah guides not the rebellious. I think that would be very, very clear that Muhammad must be dearer to you than everything in your life. Allah must be dearer to you than everything in your life. And jihad in the way of Allah must be the dearest thing to you. And if you do not do so, Allah will punish you. Let's look in the Reliance of the Traveler to confirm this statement. This is under the section called Enormities, section P, and this is P75.2. The heading is Not Loving the Prophet More Than All People. In P75.2 it says, The Prophet said, None of you believes until I am more beloved to him than his wife, child, self, and all people. Kirmani says, Love of the Prophet means the will to obey Muhammad and not to disobey him, this being one of the obligations of Islam. That's in the fight al-Qadir. And in P75.3, the Prophet said, None of you believes until his inclinations conform to what I have brought. So it goes on in Taymiyyah's book, Only those are the believers who have believed in Allah and his messenger, and have made jihad with their possessions and their lives in the way of Allah. Other translations use blood, or use lives. This one is prettified this a little bit by using the word selves. And when a clear surah is sent down and therein fighting is mentioned, you see those in whose heart is sickness, looking at you as one who faints of death, but better for them would be obedience and words honorable. Then when the matter is resolved, if they were true to Allah, it would be better for them. There are numerous similar verses in the Quran and equally frequent is the glorification of jihad and those who participate in it. So when a clear surah is sent down and fighting is mentioned, there are those Muslims who shrink away from it. And it is better for them to be 
obedient. Right, I will pause here and we'll go to the next one later. Thank you very much for your time. And if you want to support my work, please, there are PayPal links in the description and also a Bitcoin link. I would very much appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this and see you in the next one. Thank you.